France to find new and relevant ways to engage modern audiences on the subject of the First World War and also conflict to the present day. The last time this museum underwent a refurbishment was in the 1980s. So back in 2010, we started a project to transform the museum with the aim to create a new space with not only improved facilities for visitors, but also the new First World War galleries to mark the centenary of the First World War. As you can see today, our atrium at the very heart of the museum has also been transformed. The new space is designed by Foster and Partners and it's filled with uniquely uh, curated displays telling stories about Britain and the former empire chronologically from 1914 to the present day. There are over 400 objects on these galleries around you um, from the IWM collection, over which 60 have never been on public display before. Since the Imperial War Museum was founded nearly 100 years ago, we've been collecting these ordinary and extraordinary objects to record and remember the role of conflict and its effect on people's lives. Every single object in our collection, large or small, tells an individual story. And through these new and creative displays, we are showcasing the continuing work of the museum to collect, preserve and communicate people's first-hand experiences of conflict. A team including Roger Thompson, Samantha Haywood and Nigel Steele share the curation of the space that we stand in now. Roger led the project to completely reimagine the way we now present the large objects and the narrative of the atrium that we're standing in. Early concepts were realised on fuzzy front and he made them, he made, Roger made the plans in order to make sure that the Spitfire and the Harrier were placed in the right place towards the galleries and to make this amazingly dramatic hang. I'm sorry to say that Roger died in February this year and it's quite something for us today to see his visions and plans realised. Our principal historian Nigel Steele will say a few, a few things about the structure and the way that we developed the galleries in the moment. Our brand new First World War galleries, which will be free to the public, will allow audiences, young and old, to explore the First World War, what the First World War was like in depth. Each of the objects on display will give a voice to the people who created them, used them, or cared for them. Visitors will see what life was like at the front, and experience the sights and sounds of a recreated trench, with a sock with camel fighter plane and the Mark V tank looming above them. They will learn of the terrible strain the war placed on people and communities, and will be able to consider some of the, excuse me, the questions and choices, ordinary and extraordinary, that the people of Britain and its former empire had to make to face this total war. Our curator of the First World War Gallery, James Taylor, will tell you more in a moment. Also launching today are two new art exhibitions, Truth and Memory, which is British art of the First World War, and it's the largest and the first major respect retrospective of First World War art, featuring over 120 artworks. And we're also launching IWM Contemporary with artist Mark Neville, which showcases photographs and three films giving a different and a different and arrestingly intimate perspective on British troops and their daily encounters with the Afghan people. The transformation of this museum has been made possible with the support of a number of funders, sponsors, trusts, foundations and individuals, including a grant of 6.5 million from the Heritage Lottery Fund and 5 million pounds from the departure of Department of Culture and Media Sport. And obviously we are hugely grateful to them and all of our other donors who've made the transformation you'll see today possible. I'd now like to invite Nigel Steele, our principal historian to the Atrium Gallery, um, to talk to you about the, the, the way in which we've developed those galleries. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. The uh, new atrium spaces that we reveal to you today are central to RWM's wider vision of making our subject and our collections more relevant and engaging to 21st century visitors. The old atrium, which many of you may remember, although it was revolutionary in time, had lost much of its coherence and meaning. 
The medium to large sized objects it displayed existed in isolation. There was no clear link between them. We wanted to create a dynamic new central space that drew out the life stories of these objects to release the energy and entropy that each one of them holds for us. We saw the objects as speaking out loud about their role in history. Instead of the silence that existed before, for us the central feature of the new space would be a series of conversations between these objects. The atrium will become a parliament of things, with each one declaiming its significance in history. To do this, we have spent much of the last three years filling the planned new space with objects from the full range of RWM's collections, including aircraft, tanks and cars, motorbikes, guns and helmets, large bombs, suicide bombs, petrol cans and air conditioning units, air raid shelters, sit bags, telephones, toys, artworks, books and oral histories. These myriad voices of war have been drawn together into focus groups we call clusters, and through each one of those we have laced an overarching historical narrative. Our aim has been not simply to tell the story of conflict over the past 100 years. Instead, we are looking to raise questions about this vast and complex subject, to provoke consideration and curiosity, to challenge people and surprise them, to make connections for them between what they already know and what they have yet to learn. The result is not a traditional didactic gallery, but a series of highlights, of snapshots, of insights into the vast subject of global conflict since 1914. Moving through the new atrium spaces is not like reading a book. The story has no clear beginning, middle and end. Instead, it is more like turning the pages of a family photograph album. Summer holidays are followed by birthdays and then Christmas. Each is a separate episode, but together they form a single story. Like our clusters, there is an internal dynamic between them, created by their arrangement and through the memories and associations that they inspire. But the meaning of every single one is different for all of us. Working briefly through the four levels, as you descend the stairs as you've all done and enter level zero where you're now standing, you see four key objects positioned on the floor. They include the iconic Nary gun, which you'll see the field gun positioned in the centre of this floor, showing battle damage from the 1st of September 1914, and reflecting the bravery of its three Victoria Cross recipients, and also its adoption by the RWM from 1920 as a key object of remembrance. Above them are suspended two German revenge weapons, the V-1 Doodlebug and the V-2 Rocket, and two British aircraft, a Mark I Spitfire with its rich Battle of Britain history, and a GR9 Harrier which saw service with the RAF both in Kosovo and twice in Afghanistan. The museum's story in the new building now climbs up and around it, progressing through time and the scope of our remit. Level zero is embraced by the First World War galleries, running from 1900 to 1929. Above this, level one covers the years surrounding the Second World War. Called turning points, its clusters highlight eight key moments of that war. They encompass both personal objects, like the trunk filled by Leonard and Clara Vole as they tried to leave Germany, only to have their departure stopped by the outbreak of war in 1939, and which led to their deaths in Auschwitz in 1943. But also large pieces, like the cockpit section of the Australian crew Lancaster Bomber, the 467 Squadron, that flew 49 operations over Europe. Moving up, echoing the words of the United Nations Charter, Level 2 is titled Peace and Security. It examines more discursively the long, complex history of war since 1945. Many of the subjects that it covers are still unresolved. Northern Ireland, the Falklands, Korea, Cyprus, Iraq and Afghanistan. As a result, we have used a number of artworks to provoke and raise questions about how and why these things have happened. Objects again range from the original casing of the little boy atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima in August 1945 to a Noah's Ark toy made by a soldier on active service towards the end of the Second World War for his daughter far away. Like Noah, he too longed for the time when the floods would subside and he and his family could all be together again in peace. Finally, on level three, among the art galleries, are the curiosities of war. 
In the spaces created by the new architectural things, objects have been placed sometimes individually, sometimes in pairs, to reflect the unexpected and often unrecognized aspects of our region. There is often danger and fear in silence. In the First World War, the wooden trumpets of sound locators listened intently into the darkness for the sound of approaching bombers. In 2002, radical artist and musician Bill Drummond wanted to protest against the declared war on terror. He advocated a day of silence as a protest. Communication could only be carried out by printed cards from a game that he invented called Silent Protest. The link through these objects is the nuances of silence. The new atrium is intended to be a place of provocation and contemplation, raising issues of morality, motivation and character, as much as traditional history. It works through the conversations we have tried to set up between the objects. It is a new and we hope innovative space that will engage and intrigue. On its four levels, it offers insights into the history of war and conflict and its impact on people's lives over 100 years. It covers many, many aspects, many, many subjects, from today back to the outbreak of the First World War, which is covered more comprehensively by the new galleries that James will now outline for you.